City Council meeting order. And with that, I will ask the City Clerk to call the roll. Jess Brown? Present. Darcy Long Curtis? Present. Rod Bunyan? Here. Linda Miller? Here. Tim McLaughlin? Here. Mayor Mays? Here. I would like to call on Council Rod Bunyan to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please you stand if you're physically able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Our first presentation is to honor 
uh, three people that are here present tonight, uh, three special people, Lisa Commander, Robert Maxwell, and David Tuttle. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Councilor Rod Rennie. Over the years, I've had a, an opportunity to uh, meet a lot of people that have been on the honor flight to Washington, D.C. for their service to our country. But I wasn't a city councilor then, so I have a unique opportunity to make this, this particular uh, introduction special and really to thank all veterans for their service. And that's what these two gentlemen are here about tonight. But it's also important in the, in the work that I do in my veterans advocacy that spouses are included because they go through so much when their family is involved in the service. And that's men and women who have spouses that are not in the service, but they are the support at home. So that's why I've invited you all here. So first I'd like to bring up uh, Robert Max Maxwell and Jean. Come up here, please. Both of you. I'll give you a little bio on these two here, on Max. At the age of 17, Max attempted to join the Marines, but was denied. However, his parents finally agreed to sign for him to join the Navy. He was inducted into the Navy in Portland in 1951 and after boot camp in San Diego joined the deck force as a seaman aboard the fleet tug USS Chickasaw ATF-83 serving in San Diego, Korea and numerous South Sea Islands. He then served on the bridge as quartermaster navigator signalman where he messaged by flags, lights and radio in addition to mastering the skills of reading the stars and piloting the ship. When the Vietnam War commenced, Max immediately joined the Naval Reserves and served more than 30 years, including his military service as an E-8 Senior Chief SCPO. He serves currently on a number of committees, the Mid-Columbia Veterans Memorial Committee, the Wasco County Veterans Advisory Committee, he's a member of the VFW and the American Legion, and he volunteers at the Wasco County Veterans Service Office and at the Columbia Gorge Veterans Museum. And his wife, Jean, is right there with him on those activities <laughs> and is our lead board member at the Columbia Gorge Veterans Museum and was our volunteer coordinator at the Veterans Service Office for a number of years. And her son back there, Russ Jones, is our VSO at the Veterans Service <laughs> Office. Next, I want to bring up the Tullers. David and Bev Tuttle. Scoot around this way, folks. We want to make sure we get you on the camera over there. Again, a team right here. But I'm going to read the Corporal David Tuttle's bio. U.S. Army, Korea, 52 to 54. Saw action in Korea with the 45th Division, 179th Regiment, 1st Battalion, Company C. He was a BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle Expert, a rifleman on the Heartbreak Ridge. He served as a squad leader on Christmas Hill, was wounded near Queens Outpost on July 20, 1952. Corporal Tuttle received two bronze battle stars for his participation in the Battle of Christmas Hill. He later transferred to the 5th Regimental Combat Team, Company B, in February of 1953 and served on Kojidu Island for five months as a squad leader. He served his last three months stateside for the 44th Division at Fort Lewis, Washington. And now I want to bring up a really important part of the honor flight. Lisa Commander was a guardian on the flight. And the Maxwells also had, uh, was it your son-in-law? Yes, U.S. Navy. Navy veteran Jack Fournier? Yes, sir. Was a, was a guardian as well. Lisa, and let's go around this way, folks. I'm doing this, I said is watching me. Now. Keep coming, keep coming. Good. Um, Lisa is our current director of the Columbia Gorge Veterans Museum on 2nd Street, right by the Legion Hall, which is now turning into another 
facility and has been responsible from day one of changing the exhibits and keeping Gene and I busy down there from time to time. By the way, I'll be the receptionist tomorrow from one to five. Come visit. <laughs> Helps the time go by. And she is going to become the education director here shortly of the uh, Discovery Center out on Highway 30. And uh, we'll be looking for another director. She's promised not to desert us too quickly. But uh, we're always looking for board members as well. So. But anyway, I just want to thank you all personally, and the mayor has a proclamation here for you, and I'll let him do that part. This is a certificate of re recognition for Lisa Commander, uh, Mr. <coughs> Kennel, and Mr. Maxwell, and Rod's biography pretty much details all of the, uh, the details of the certificate. Well, I'll just read the last paragraph, and it says, On behalf of the City Council and the citizens of the Dalles, please accept our sincere gratitude for your service to our veterans and representing our community on the honor flight to Washington, D.C. Uh, Washington, Thank you all very much. Some kind of an order. What 
two buildings would be the top priority out of this list. So that's the, the next step on the, the tenth is, is what we will be doing is, is trying to prioritize. Mm -hmm. And we may need uh, one additional meeting if we do. That would be in uh, early January. And then we need to get this finalized and that 10 year plan sent in. So uh, we really invite the public to come and, and uh, take a look at this material. This, it can be found on the website, uh, but we actually need the community to uh, work with us and, and help us make that determination. And it, it, when we send this in, you, you could obviously, you can change your, your mind uh, later on, but uh, the, the plan itself needs to be in in order for us to go forward um, in the future with a, uh, any bond planning. <coughs> Uh, because that would uh, be part of narrowing down what what you would want to do for a bond, and then it would uh, this particular plan being accepted by the state will make us eligible for up to four million dollars in, in matching. Uh, not guaranteed that we could get it, but we certainly want to put in for that. And I will push you for using the top two because we need the public to do that. So I appreciate that. I want to put any seeds out there. Big, I, I think the public really needs to take a look at it and, and um, give us the input. Uh, on the 10th, where? On the 10th of the Dallas Middle School, okay. in the library at the middle school, okay. starting at 6 p.m. Councilman Watson, <clears throat> on the year built, there are multiple years for some of the uh, schools. Why is that? Well, for example, on, on Colonel Wright, there were uh, parts of the building that were uh, added uh, and, and or uh, significantly built onto during those. That, that's why you have the different years. I see one missing to the Dallas High School, the Skill Center. That doesn't seem to be included. I think that was built in the 70s, uh, 1974, I think, 75. Skill Center. The addition on that, was yeah. It, yeah. Okay. It, it uh, covers the different sites of the Dells High School, but it didn't list that particular piece as being separate. Following up on Council Runyon's question, um, if you look at the 30% threshold for being in poor condition, yeah. it looks like three of the schools. The Watanaka, Colonel Wright, and the high school all exceed the 30% level. Am I reading that correctly? Yes. So it'd be fair to say that those three schools are in poor condition? Correct. Any other questions? Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Our final presentation is from, uh, is from Councilor. Marcy Long Curtis and our assistant to the city manager, Matthew Cleaves, regarding the recent community outreach team trip to Washington, D.C. Well, thank you very much, honorable mayor and members of council. As you stated, Councilor Long Curtis and I are here to update you on the recent trip to Washington, D.C. as part of the community outreach team. Um, as you know, this team is made up of community partners, community stakeholders such as D21, uh, the county, the city, of course, uh, the college, and the port, and they travel to Washington, D.C. once or twice a year to advocate for the needs and issues or projects that our community has. Um, as you can see in the agenda staff report, the team brought a number of different projects and policies that our community is facing to discuss with legislators and their staff. And this outreach and adv advocacy not only helps communicate our needs to our representatives, but it also provides us with a substantial amount of information on where potential funding sources may be, um, potential new partners or partners we haven't reached out to, um, and different ways to think or approach uh, a certain project or a policy that we might be grappling with. Uh, we also learn about the current uh, mindset or some of the buzzwords that are kind of a hot topic in Washington, D.C., and when we were there this past trip, um, two of the ones that stuck out to me were pre-disaster mit mitigation and resiliency. Um, those two phrases or that phrase and that word seem to highlight some of the um, priority issues or um, uh, areas of most concern uh, that we're, we're pressing with some of the legislators. And when we're writing a grant or seeking out funding, using some of those buzzwords can, can be of assistance. 
Um, this most notably applied to the East Cascade Interconnection Project uh, that is looking at a feasibility study uh, to uh, explore the possibility of uh, maintaining the connection that we have uh, towards the east, uh, away from the Cascade Mountains, to maintain the uh, communication network that we have, the internet access that we have in the event or when the Cascadia earthquake occurred. The Treaty Oak Skill Center uh, was another uh, project that seemed to impress many of the people that we met with, um, not only for the project itself, but for the collaboration that has brought that project into existence. Uh, that project uh, used uh, support and funds from the state, from the city, from the county, uh, from the port, and many others to, to bring that project forward. And uh, we met with um, the Department of Education, uh, the National, oh, I'm really blank, National Association of Community Colleges, and they were very impressed by that scope of that project and what we were trying to accomplish. And Department of Labor, and Department of Labor yeah. And I think this highlights another key takeaway for me, which was the team itself. Uh, what I really appreciated on that trip was that the people who went on the team are not just advocating for their own project, a uh, project that is the city's or not is the, uh, not the city's. Uh, we're looking out for the, the best of the community, uh, that benefits the entire community, and we really show to the people that we are meeting with that this is one community with all of us pulling together on these projects that affect us all. Um, and finally, um, and before I went, this is kind of amusing to me, but uh, in some of the preparation work that we did, uh, all the members who had gone previously mentioned these uh, small tokens of appreciation that we <coughs> give to the people we meet with. Um, and these are uh, small bags of chocolate covered cherries. No, Agricultural products of de minimis value. Thank you. <laughs> Agricultural products of de minimis value. And they are a hit. And they really help to tie that relationship um, that the team has developed and grown over their many visits. Um, they know the Dow. They know Wasco County. They know um, the community. And uh, it, it helps to uh, stick in their mind as they uh, move from group to group. You felt really exaggerated. <laughs> Except that everyone said, oh, are you the cherry people? Yeah, it's very true. It's, it's a highly effective tool, it seems like. And, um, uh, and I think one thing to note is that these uh, policies and projects that we are going back to Washington, D.C. with are often long-term projects. They take a long time to develop, uh, just like the relationships that the team grows over their visits. And uh, the, some of the policies or some of the projects, most notably, um, the uh, economic development funding through the National Scenic Area are things that we have worked on for, for quite some time. And you need to have that consistent presence to uh, have cautious, cautious optimism uh, that there will be process and progress going forward. Um, so those are some of the key highlights for me. Uh, it was a great uh, experience. It was a great team that went. And I'll turn it over to Councilor Long Curtis to add anything else. Sure. Did you want to name the team members or? Oh, sure. That's okay. So on um, this particular trip, we had um, Greg Wiest uh, and Andrea Class from the Port of Adels. We had Scott Hagee from Wasco County and Randy Anderson from District 21, as well as Dan Spots from Henry Gorge Community College and myself and Matthew representing the Dells. And of course, in the staff report, you can see the long list of meetings that we attended. and. Um, you can see from this list that we spent a lot of time running around to all of the different um, Congress people, some senators. Uh, we did leave one off. We did also see uh, Senator Patty Murray because we do visit both the Washington and the Oregon delegation because, of course, we have the airport and some other things in common. Um, we weren't able to speak with her personally, but we did take the cherries to her constituent coffee, and so we sort of stole the coffee attention, <laughs> but uh, we didn't get one-on-one -on -one with her. But it, it is important, and um, we were talking about one of the major projects, and you know we're cautiously optimistic, but the Scenic Gorge, um, as we know, when that was funded, um, we got our money for economic, or excuse me, we did not get our money for economic development fully funded. We only got the um, environmental and the um, tourism piece funded. And so we have been working for very many years, when I say we, I mean the community outreach team, which has been many members, and to the point that that line item was actually struck from the federal budget. It didn't exist anymore. And because we lobbied and we found a way, we got it back in. And right now, if it goes through reconciliation, we might actually 
from Wisconsin. So that's just some of the hard work. And I know sometimes people wonder why we go back twice a year and, and is it really worth the money? But I really do believe that it is. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions for the counselor or, or for Matthew? Thank you very Thank much. You very much. <clears throat> Item six is audience participation. During this portion of the meeting, anyone may speak on any subject which does not later appear on the agenda. Five minutes per person will be allowed. If a response by the city is requested, the speaker will be referred to the city manager for further action. The issue may appear on a future meeting agenda for city council consideration. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to the City Council on any item that's not on the agenda? Mr. Dunning. Yes. Um, Please give your name and address. And Jerry Dunning, 1814 Minnesota Street, Dallas, Oregon. Could you use the microphone? Or, uh, I need that, or that's just for records? Letters. They want you on camera. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it. Okay. Um, Jerry Dunning, 1814 Minnesota Street, Dallas, Oregon. Could you use the microphone? Letters. They want you on camera. Where does my time start? Right um, now? As soon as you start your presentation. <laughs> I have no pre presentation. Uh, you might have seen some signs, billboards out that look similar like that. Orange in color says, break the silence. Does anybody know what the silence is? Have you checked it? I didn't know until a couple of months ago. The silence is sex trafficking, teenage sex trafficking, and slavery. More slavery today in the United States than there was during the Civil War. The most active city we have down there, called the Rose City, is the most prolific trafficker, not in Oregon, but in the United States. Uh, what is teenage? 13 years old is the average age, down to two and three. These people come in and they try to uh, buy, sell, or steal <laughs> children, <laughs> teenagers, whatever. Uh, you go to that Anybody go to that hashtag on there that says eight day film? Look at that. It's a typical, not it's a documentary, but it's typical of what happened to a 16 year old young lady. The um, people in her school, I'm gonna call them classmates, no, but they sold her for their own drug money. She was used for eight days, 50 times in eight days. Sold and imagine that. Um, I go and talk to wherever I can get in. I talk to the mayor and he says, yeah, you've got five minutes. So I'm down here to encourage you to break the silence. Tell your friends, your neighbors, look out for those little ones. I've got great grandchildren that are in this group from 16 down to uh, about five and six, uh, two and a half. And they live in two of them are in Portland. The other two are here. So they're in vulnerable areas. People will come into their homes and steal these young people right out of their home. They'll take them away from parks, out of automobiles. It's a silent epidemic that we need to be aware of. That's all. Watch your children. You cannot, we kept our little great granddaughter almost continuous since she was two years old. Taught her that if we have that eye contact, you're all right with us. But if you're going over there, we can't see you, and you can't see us, don't go there. A few weeks ago, we were up at the shelter for a <clears throat> in the park for a birthday party. She comes over and tells Grandma, I've got to go to the bathroom. She did that by herself. She learned that. Keep that eye contact. So uh, time about up. Who's timing me? I am. Yeah. You're actually doing very well. You got a couple <laughs> minutes. Well, that's all. It, it's a silent epidemic out there. Do what you can to tell your people. Uh, you know somebody that I could go preach my silent message to? I would gladly go. Uh, I've been to the schools. I've been to the Qantas. I've been to the Lions. Now I've been to the city council. And uh, let's see. A, a hospital. A couple of businesses that I think have a large group. And they I know, as you know, some of you, you take a training safety program every now and then. They could bring this up. Uh, I do feel that the churches could do nothing more than just put it in their bulletins or in their newsletters. But give us a sermon on this. This is an epidemic. You know, we are familiar with the 
<coughs> what the uh, swine flu and uh, myself because of family polio epidemic that was going on back then. This is much worse. So thank you for your time. Hang on just a second. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask Gary? Um, you mentioned some of the groups you've talked to. Have you talked to any law enforcement people? Uh, I guess this uh, gentleman sitting in the back, I've talked with him a few times. Yes. Okay. In fact, uh, I guess we made a visit to uh, the coffee break one day. And I can say he fully wants to know if you see anything, call him. 911. He would rather get 100 calls, no problem, than one that they miss. I can say that to that gentleman back there. Thank you very much. Oh, I lose that all the time. <laughs> Next on the agenda are reports. We'll start with the city manager report. Thank you, Mayor Mays. The city received an invitation for the festival of trees event, which is December 6th. So I just wanted to let the city council know if any of you would like to attend as representatives of the city, if you would please let myself or us all know in the next couple of days we will give you the tickets for that. And I have a request for the use of our safety funds. We have learned that we have to do a different kind of crane training than we've ever done before. And it used to be just a couple hundred dollars per person. It's way more than that to get this new training but it's required uh, by the state so we are asking the city council to approve eighteen thousand sixty dollars to get everyone trained on the crane and then i have a request for seven more of the standing desks that we've been kind of getting sporadically in the amount of twenty eight hundred for the total of twenty thousand eight hundred sixty dollars we still have about forty nine thousand in this year's budget what, what was the total before? The total Under the old fees, what was the total? Oh my gosh, I think it was only a couple hundred dollars per person. person? Mm -hmm. How many? Mm -hmm. What was the rough total of that? Mm -hmm. It was around 4000 like the whole budget. Mm -hmm. About 4000 mm -hmm. I will vouch for, for the increase because we have the space. I, I just want to know what the difference was. It, it's big. Council Brown? I question whether we need to train everybody at Public Works to run the crane. We have asked for volunteers and we have well, four for each division. Four for each division, yeah. So we're, we're not training, we're training about half of them. We think about half that may be 20. I mean, it's, the crane doesn't get used every day. It's not. But you have to be certified to use it. So if two people are out sick on a crew, then you have to have someone who can do it. have four or five in the in the, in the agency, in public works, I don't understand why everybody has to be trained. We went from, uh, we originally thought we were going to train everybody, if, if I may, and uh, so we were training 23 or something like that. We went down to 12. It only reduced the cost of the training by about $4,000 because a bulk of the cost is just training the contractor on the site. Uh, the uh, employee specific cost to actually take the test and then get certification uh, is a few hundred dollars per employee. So if we even cut the, the 12 employees in half again, we aren't saving that much, but we're starting to give up our reliability, I guess, and being sure we have people uh, available to do the job when it's needed. Anybody else have any questions for the city manager? Thank you. Uh, the city attorney report. Could I please get a motion to our mm -hmm. consensus to spend the funds? Can I have a motion? Uh, I move to approve the um, funds for the crane certifications and the desks. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Any more discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank motion you. carries. Okay, the city attorney's report. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Mays. One item I want to share with the council. Some months ago, we had a parcel of property that's off of uh, West City Drive. It's a vacant lot that uh, the city acquired through uh, 
foreclosure of taxes by the county and it's been vacant for some time. The council clerk surplus uh, the staff and look at the property feel that there could be a question about access for the property. Uh, if you've been by it, uh, there's not a particular road that goes up by the property. There appears to be a dirt path, but we don't know whether that is the area that's shown as right away on the map. And so I've arranged with Pens and Engineering to have the property surveyed so we know exactly where the boundaries are and whether this dirt path is the area that shows the right away so that we know that there is access for the property because if there's not, that can affect its marketability. If there is access, the property certainly can be developed for residential use and it's a fairly, it's actually two lots that are together, it's fairly large, so we think it could be sold for development if we can <coughs> confirm it's got access. So Tennyson will be doing the survey once we do that, they won't be able to proceed with actually uh, putting it out for some bids and hopefully sell it and get some money from the sale. What is the address of that? It doesn't have an address. It's uh, I'm trying to think of a close residence. Uh, there's a, on the map, there's a road called Will's Way that apparently I don't think it's ever been developed, but it's uh, in that vicinity and I'm trying to think of the closest property. I think it's about <coughs> the 700 block of uh, West Sing drive in that area. You mm -hmm. can't see it from the street. It's, is that it's, 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 uh, it may actually be it east. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be east. Mm -hmm. And it's right now, there's a fair amount of vegetation that has sort of uh, gone away, so the surveyors think they can get on the property much easier. And they said this is a good time of year to do the survey. So they'll do it, but it's kind of difficult to see as you're driving by. It's back away from the scenic itself. I can drive you out there and show you where it's here. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd like to look at it. I'll give me a call. All right. But we think it does have the potential to be developed if we can just make sure it's got access. So that we'll know that once the survey is done. And that's city owned or is it? Community? Yes, that is, we acquired it from the county back in 1988. Uh, <clears throat> it was given to us for no consideration. I don't know at that time what <laughs> was discussed with the county, but they apparently didn't want it and they gave it to the city. So we've had it since 1988. Any estimated value on that property? I think the assessor has it in the range of $30,000 currently. For both lots? Uh, I think for the entire, for both lots at this point. Wow. That's my entire yeah. lot. Uh, I've not talked to any realtor to see. It needs considerable development. <coughs> yeah. we'll, we'll probably have a discussion with local realtors to determine you know, if, it, if it does have access, what would be an appropriate price. But with the market now, with people looking for lots, we may be able to get more than what the assessor has valued at. Okay. All right. Thank you, Gene. <coughs> Next on the agenda is City Council reports. We'll start with Council Miller. Okay, um, on the 11th, I attended the Veterans Day Parade and I saw Councilor um, Blaine a couple of times around the circle. Um, the 15th, uh, the was on a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> Um, on the 15th, the uh, City Council had a special meeting uh, regarding the hiring of a uh, city attorney. And on the 19th, the urban renewal meeting. Um, and that was in regards to uh, selling the Coney building. On the 20th, I attended um, the Dallas Sisters, the 20th, and then again on this last Sunday, the Dallas Sister City interviews. We are interviewing young people our students here that will go to Japan uh, in the summer. A good group so far that we've interviewed. On the 22nd, I attended the ribbon, ribbon cutting rebrand opening of the Bud Meyer. And um, uh, again, uh, uh, on this next Tuesday, I'll have more interviews. Uh, we have about 17 applicants that want to go to Japan. That's students. There's, I believe, there's seven um, that want to be um, chaperones. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Ryan. Uh, let's see here. Um, since the 28th, on October 31, a rules and conduct meeting. Uh, as we get that uh, closer to fruition, for the council to look at. Uh, also on the 31st, uh, was downtown Halloween crossing guard. Thank you, Tim, very You're much. Welcome very much. <laughs> on November 1st, um, McCann held their economic forum they do annually, and I was invited there as a uh, board member of eight years and 
served on four, four different Matera committees actually during that time. On the 1st of uh, November also, that evening, and again uh, just this weekend, uh, volunteer announcer for the uh, state playoff games, and uh, uh, the mayor helped me, uh, and grandson Carter helped uh, spot the defense for me at the quarterfinal game out of the Sid White Field of Wataka. On the 2nd, we had a, uh, a funeral I want to mention here because she was such a great community volunteer and a personal friend, Marlis Crime passed away. Um, and people that ever came to a baseball game at the Bells High or Hustlers American Legion played, she was, she was at the gate and her husband was alive, he was there as well, and bringing the flags out onto the field at home plate. Uh, so she will be missed. On the 6th of November, we had another rules and conduct meeting. On the 7th of November, a True Life Internet meeting on behalf of the city. Um, volunteer receptionist on the 8th of November at the Columbia Gorge Veterans Museum. We had the Veterans Parade, and I led the Patriot Guard writers uh, around the circles a few times on that one. Um, we had a council special session where we uh, discussed the need for uh, city attorney and how that will take shape. And I think we were moving in that direction. And then on the 16th, uh, again, there was another football game. Urban renewal meeting uh, came just as a citizen observer. We already have three council people on the uh, dais for that one, but I'm enjoying watching it from the back and answering my own questions and encourage people to show up for that. Uh, on the 21st, uh, I attended the Wasco County Pioneer Association, of, of which I'm a past president. And uh, today, uh, outside the Wire Veterans Committee at the Veterans Home today, uh, a group that uh, raises money for uh, veterans' causes around the area and uh, funds a band called Got Your Six. So you can go to see the band Got Your Six, local places. Uh, mm -hmm. The money that they get paid goes right into this veterans' charity. That's my money. Thank you. Councilor Long Curtis. Thank you. So I also attended the executive session to talk about our next steps for finding a um, city attorney position. And I attended the urban renewal and we did, as Councilor Miller said, we did uh, select a proposal for the Tony's building and now um, Jeannie Parker is it doing the exclusive negotiating agreement, correct? And then they'll be looking at the development and um, disposition agreement as well, so hopefully we'll get something put into that county building finally. Um, most of my time since the last meeting has been spent um, working, I guess, on the homeless and the warming shelter. So um, I started by going down and just talking with people. Um, I was contacted by someone from uh, the Vancouver area who asked me to find a specific person that they were concerned about. And so through that process, trying to find that person, uh, asking people their stories, locating that person, and trying to shepherd them through the process here in town, um, I just frankly discovered that the system is completely broken. I mean, I'll just be honest. I'm sorry. Um, it sounds so good on paper, but it's just not working. I was not able to get this person who I see is completely in need of services, any services. I picked her up three separate times and took her to appointments. Um, just getting her there and finding her every time was a crisis because she's homeless and I didn't know where to look for her. And the system requires that you come back for multiple appointments. You can't just go in once and get an evaluation. You have to go in and be seen in person. I couldn't make the appointment for her. And then I had to bring her back a week later. And then I had to wait two weeks to bring her back for another appointment. And I was lucky to get that appointment two weeks away because they told me they had 45 days to do it. And this is a person that I felt um, was in imminent danger herself. Um, tonight is the first night that the warming shelter is open. Um, no? From last week. Second. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. So as you know, we've had some cold weather and um, and we're looking for more volunteers. Um, there is a volunteer, I believe, from each church who handles each night's schedule. Um, I am the overall schedule coordinator now, so if you need a name and number, if you want to work on a particular night, it's actually much easier than it seems um, to do. And I'd love to talk to you about it. 
Um, I just I want to say that, and I also just want to point out that before we got the warmth shelter open, there was an outbreak of scabies in one of the camps where people were in a group, and it's um, very contagious. And so I'm still working with the health department on how we're going to handle this, but it's something as simple as the people have to, each person has to come to the medical appointment and get their own prescription. And then the prescription actually is for something that they have to put on their whole body, and then they have to shower it off the next day. And some of these people do not have access to that. Um, some people, you, the shelter does have showers, but not everyone is allowed. Some people have had behavior and they're not allowed to be there. Um, so we are working on possibly thinking outside the box and maybe bringing the medical people to the camp um, and then doing something that way. But I just, I just want to encourage everyone not to make assumptions and, you know, we all hear about the stereotypes of the people. But when I went and talked to people about their personal stories, I didn't hear anything like those stereotypes that we have. So I just want to say I think these people are worth our time and our effort, and they are part of our community. Thank you. Thank you. How's it run? I don't have too much information on that, but my chair broke a few minutes ago, and I'm going to take a moment to turn it upside down and find out what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Did you bring a utility knife? No. You probably pass them all the time. Yeah. Thank you for making that announcement. Thank you for having the chair recognize you. <laughs> Councilor McLaughlin. Yes, sir. I also attended the uh, city attorney <coughs> meeting. I drove in the veterans parade with the parade marshal, who was a World War II veteran. And it was a pleasure listening to his story. And what I noticed with the windows rolling down, people thanking him for his service, little kids, and that, that made me very proud. Um, I attended a meeting with Chris Zukin, Dave Ludkins, Mike Kilkenny, and myself, and this was dealing with the homeless issue as well. And it's not really representative of the city council, but it's on my own time that I'm taking interest, and it's the uh, speedy, motel on 2nd Street that is the owner of that, or the owners, would like to see it demolished and, and rest. But we're hoping to keep it uh, because it would be a great place for low income and homeless people to develop that property and keep it where we could, at least eight units, we could get eight people off the street. And so um, the owner of that property was very interested and we are looking for ways of funding, getting the money to purchase, and uh, we'll look down the road and keep negotiating on that property. I did attend the urban renewal along with my two fellow counselors, and we are moving forward for the sale of the Tony's building, which is um, hopefully will take place. Historic landmark, uh, this last time was goal setting, and we spent quite a, a lengthy time uh, discussing goals. Uh, Main Street yesterday uh, at 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, my grandchildren, myself, and Tony Howe from the Lions Club uh, participated and cleaned up a section of the downtown. Thank you very much, Main Street, for doing that for our city. The Elf Food Drive is coming up the December 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Everyone loves a firefighter, and they're, they're in need of uh, people to help, especially youth to pick up the food and the lions and other groups will be there to sort the food into boxes for dis distribution to the community. And that ends my report. Thank you, Councilor. Under the mayor's report, I also was a, uh, at the suggestion of Councilor McLaughlin, was a crossing guard for the Halloween festivities downtown. And thank you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs> When I went up to Councilor McLaughlin that evening, I asked him if we were going to be trained. Uh, and he said, you want to get trained? And I said, yeah, I think there's some public safety issues here. So he handed me a sign that said, slow on one side and stop on the other, and said, that's your training, now go to your post. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Ryan. I've got a little bit more training than that. <laughs> 
November 5th, I attended one of the aforementioned uh, District 21 long-term planning meetings at the, at the middle school. On November 7th, I spoke to the Aquinas Club. On November the 11th, I attended the art auction along with Councillor Brown. And on November the 12th, I attended the Gorge Commission meeting at Skamania. November 13th, I attended the, uh, a session that was held to talk about the hiring of a new school superintendent, and that was held at Cousins. And um, I just want to mention also to the City Council that on Thursday, January 16th, the Chamber of Commerce is going to be having their annual banquet. And I think it would be nice if as many City Councilors could attend that as possible. The City will pay for your ticket. And I would like to ask the City Manager if, um, if she would organize, if it might be possible to get a table. Number 10 is the consent agenda. Items of a routine and non-controversial nature are placed on the consent agenda to allow the City Council to, to spend its time and energy on important items and issues. Any council may request an item be pulled from the consent agenda and be considered separately. Items pulled from the consent agenda will be placed on the agenda at the end of action item section. We only have one item on the consent agenda, and that is the approval of the October 28th Rego City Council meeting minutes. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. And I can second that. We moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 11A, public hearings. This is a public hearing regarding short term rental licenses in the city of the Dallas. This is time scheduled for public hearing to allow for public testimony concerning General Ordinance Number 19-1374, amending Title 8 of the Dallas Municipal Code by adding Chapter 8.02 entitled Short-Term Rental License and General Ordinance Number 19-1375, amending Title 10 of the Dallas Municipal Code by repealing Article 6.040 entitled Bed and Breakfast Vacation Rental. Prior to opening the public hearing, I will ask the council members if anyone desires to make a disclosure or abstain from participating or voting on this matter due to a conflict of interest due to personal, due to possible personal financial gain resulting from this legislative action. After asking for a declaration of any conflict of interest, I'll ask for a staff report. Following the staff report, I will ask persons who wish to present testimony to come to the microphone, state their name and address, and present their testimony. All speakers are requested to be specific in their presentations and to focus their remarks upon the relevant issues raised by the proposed general ordinances, numbers 19-1374 and 19-1375. Again, please be specific in your presentation and focus on the remarks upon the relevant issues raised by those two ordinances. With that, I will open the public hearing. And ask for a de declaration of any conflict of interest due to personal and possible financial gain. Does any council member wish to make a declaration? No. No. Hearing none, I will now ask for a staff report. Thank you. Uh, good evening, councilors, Mr. Mayor, Joshua Chandler, Community Development Department. Uh, I just want to start out with uh, a couple last minute uh, formatting clerical errors that uh, were noticed this morning. Um, a memorandum has been provided to you. Um, it spells out pretty specific. Um, the, the issue was that a, a wrong resolution number was cited. So <coughs> that is referenced page 3861, 62, 63. Um, it should read, uh, when it's referencing a resolution number, it should be 581-19. Um, additionally, that resolution was provided, so we have provided you with um, 58119, and then there was a formatting error on pages 41 and 42 with an indentation of the word signs. It should not have been indented um, after that will get going on here. Um, <clears throat> this is a two-part uh, process, uh, this, uh, the adoption of the general ordinances 19-1374 and 75. Uh, both of 
them um, together are are important for the process of uh, the new short-term rental program for the city of Dallas. Um, over the years around the country, we've seen around the world really we've seen the growth of this peer-to-peer -peer property rental vacation rental company. Um, it's uh, referenced as the, the sharing economy. Um, very very popular companies, uh, Home Away, VRBO, Airbnb. Uh, the length of stay usually for these, uh, it can vary, uh, but when you're talking short-term rentals, um, just about every jurisdiction as well as ours, um, those are stays of, of 30 days or less. Um, the thing to point out is that Airbnb uh, has gained criticism for the past uh, few years, and you can do any Google search and find out um, lawsuits and appeals throughout the country. Uh, for a lot of a lot of it uh, pertains to the protection that Airbnb has for its guests, for its customers, its guests and its hosts. A lot of times, those protections go against the rules and regulations of many municipalities. Uh, because of that, uh, definitely throughout Oregon, communities have started modifying the current code. I'm just trying to tighten up on these regulations. Uh, within the city of the Dallas, we um, administer. Um, short-term rentals through our bed and breakfast and vacation rental permit. It's article 6.040 in uh, Title 10. Um, this is a, a, a process that uh, no fee is collected by the department. Um, in a report to, to City Council May 13th um, in the fee adjustment process, um, we, we discovered that it was taking about a little over nine and a half hours uh, to review and process these permits with a total cost of just about $360. And as mentioned, uh, there's no fee collected. Um, since leaning on that, that growth, uh, since September 2018, of the 22 currently permitted bed and breakfast permits, um, 18 of them have been approved since then. So um, that growth you can see in um, the most updated figures here for the transient room taxes, where we've seen a 124% growth um, between 2017 and 2019. Uh, this, the reason we're here today um, is, is the adoption process of a new short-term rental license, which will replace the bed and breakfast vacation uh, permit. Now, at a legal issues seminar, uh, Don and I attended uh, this last year uh, there was there's a conversation, quite a bit of conversation, talking about these appeals, these uh, lawsuits, things of that nature, and a lot. It, it pointed at the fact that a lot of communities are moving toward a licensing program rather than a permitting program. Uh, the difference being is you you remove the land use side of it. There's some subjectivity that would then follow um, in the framework of a short-term rental license from one looking at if it meets or does not meet more of a yes and no than, um, <coughs> yeah, like I said, that's some subject, subjectivity. Um, this short-term rental, what's in front of you, the proposed uh, short-term rental license, it, it follows our current bed and breakfast, um, the formatting of it. However, staff, uh, we've, over the past couple months, have provided uh, some, you know, some changes in, in fees, um, home inspection requirements, parking requirements, and hopefully some precautions for nuisance prevention. Um, next little blurb in the staff report pretty much talks about just this is being a, um, a multi-step process. So uh, the first step is that we took uh, the removal, the removal of trap of Article 6.040 to Planning Commission, uh, a zoning ordinance amendment 99-19, uh, with the subsequent approval of resolution 581-19. And that recommended to city council to take the bed and breakfast permit out of Title 10. So that will be the, the staff report that's following this. What this staff report is, is um, adopting or amending Title, title 8, a business title, and inserting this in so that this will then be um, under the same um, title as uh, transient merchant license, transient room tax, second dealer license, rather than a land use <coughs> permit. Um, 
as far as, far as public outreach, um, <coughs> staff reached out to, there was the, the proper noticing uh, for the different meetings, but uh, staff reached out uh, in early September requesting some comment from current bed and breakfast holders on the 22. Uh, we received four responses back. Um, at that time, one uh, property owner uh, sat down, uh, had a discussion with us in person, and there was one other that provided um, additional comments. So, you know, there's, like I said, the date of this uh, document as of today, it's, we've received only the four responses. Uh, so the next step is, um, uh, the, the recommendation by staff is, is moving to adopt General Ordinance 19-1374, which uh, amends Title VIII, and it adds Chapter 8.02, short-term rental license, to the Dallas Municipal Code. And I am more than happy to take any questions. Uh, sir, yeah, the council can ask for staff questions at this time, and we'll go to public testimony. Does anybody on the city council have any uh, questions for, for Josh? I have one. Um, 8.02050 license requirements. H. No short term rental shall be used for special events during periods of transient rental. Uh, would a birthday party be considered uh, a special event? I, I mean, right. I, that seems silly, but it, it could be. Yeah, um, and that is, you know, this is language that's um, definitely added in from, you know, looking at, at others. I think uh, when it was put in there, it was the idea that these would not be used as event sites. So I guess down to a birthday party, no. <laughs> I guess is how the code currently reads. Um, but the renting out, I think the idea around this requirement is the renting out of a space as a venue to have a party um, is, you know, an accessory used to the original residential dwelling. Um, you know, residential dwelling, of course, if you, you go in your own house, you have a birthday party, there's not much of an issue because that's your residence. And that's the primary use. Um, I think the language, I guess this language would restrict like that. Councilor Brown. Hey, uh, I noticed here that most of the questions that people had for you were in regards to the fees for the licensing and home inspection. If, if we move to approve this ordinance, what's that going to do? I mean, basically it says here that, that the, the staff providing the fees have not been established at this time. It, it's kind of like, I guess my question is, are we approving something that we really don't have the whole story on? I mean, shouldn't the, shouldn't, it, I don't know, I, I guess I'd be curious to know what, what change this is going to make in the financial end of it. And I, and I admit, I don't fully understand most of what you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, the action of a fee amendment to the city's current fee schedule is an action by city council. So it's something that uh, we made sure that the actual price point of an application of a home inspection would not be included in an ordinance. In the event that a fee changes in the future, you would have to change your ordinance to reflect that change. Um, we had intended on on getting uh, the fee schedule to the next meeting. However, it will be January 13th. We will be presenting an amendment to the fee schedule. There's a couple other departments, I think, that are amending some fees as well. Um, at that time, um, this is based off of what we did as a, a per room per year. And right now we're looking at about uh, 75 to $100 per room a year. Um, and that is based on just um, real kind of around this cost recovery for it. Um, it it's, it's kind of in line with the home business permit, which we recently raised to, to $85. That gives us a 25% cost recovery of the actual application. So 
I think the idea to stay in line, I think our, our idea uh, was kind of staying in line with the home business pricing at this time. Seventy five dollars doesn't sound terribly reasonable. Something like that. No, I, I mean, and you're talking of uh, an annual fee. So a lot of these, you know, Airbnbs, that's maybe two nights when you pay for it. As a follow-up to that, you, you mentioned and it's in your report that a, a, a permit typically right now costs the city about three hundred sixty dollars. So, is that all staff time, or is there any other expenses associated with that number? Yeah, it would be staff time and uh, mailing. Mailings is probably be. right. Okay. Yeah. I thought that referred to the previous being under the. Um, land use rather than under the license. So it's different, right? It takes less staff time. Is that part of the reason um, for the license? To help well, save that way as well? Yeah, I guess that was the cost recovery for the bed and breakfast vacation rental permit. Um, since we haven't done the short term rental license yet, we don't know what the, you know, the time it would take to review these applications. However, there is. Um, there's, there's noticing requirements. Um, there's, there's quite a few things. Preparing a staff report, um, preparing a notice of decision that goes into a land use process that um, would definitely be removed with the license. It's more, um, like I said, it's, it's kind of a checklist. We prepared a, um, an application for you, and it's, like I said, it's, it's something submitted. If it doesn't meet it, then it's, it's not approved. Council so Brown? You're suggesting that that worst case scenario is likely to be a wash as far as the, the fee. Uh, I mean, the, 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 what it is for the bed and breakfast as opposed to, uh, to this ordinance. You don't expect the price to go up noticeably, or could it be possibly less? Uh, I. I guess I would I would say that a little bit less will be less of a review. Okay. It's just just my assumption at this point. I I handled of these eighteen. <coughs> I think I've uh, done seventeen of them, so I kind of got it down to a science. <laughs> Councilor McLaughlin. Currently, there's no bed and breakfast fee. Correct. Correct. And. We have a home business license fee of eighty-five dollars. Correct. Do we have a business license fee for a retail outlet? Not a business license. You know my next question. Why? <laughs> because that's not me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying that if we have a fee for this, this, why not this? That's something to look down the road. Well, actually, we are looking at that right now. Okay. You may or may not recall, last at the beginning of the year, I asked if that was something the council would entertain discussing. So we're putting together some information for you too. Well, in light of what I'm learning tonight, I would say it's very appropriate that we have a consistent licensing. It would also aid, I think, in uh, knowing what businesses we have out there. We may not even have a registry of. We may not know what businesses. What about transient businesses that, uh, the mobile, are, do they have a license? It's coming before you the next year. I understand, okay. Interesting. But I would like to see uh, consistency between all the different licenses. <coughs> I would also, however, uh, the staff is working on that, so I'm sure something's great. coming for us. Any other questions, <coughs> Councilor Ryan? I want to follow up on Linda's uh, request on uh, 802.050H, correct? Uh, no short-term no short rentals shall be used for special events during periods of transient rental. We talked about birthday parties. A lot of, I've uh, got some people, they want to stay, some of our folks are here for uh, the 4th of July event or Cherry Festival, that's an event, and they could not rent the room for that, they'd be in violation? Am I reading that correctly? No, the, the, the requirement wouldn't pertain to a, a city-wide event. Um, you could definitely, would probably um, garner quite a bit of attention on a, 
July 4th weekend. But the idea of throwing your own individual individual July 4th party at the short-term rental would be prohibited. So there's a broader definition somewhere of what these apply to, or do we need to have something in that line to uh, specify what we're talking about there? Because I think I read it like you did. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's that's special cool. events, well, citywide, I mean, that's why a lot of people would come here. So maybe we need a little more definitive uh, line there about what we're talking about. Or okay. definitions elsewhere. If there, but I know you have some definitions at the front. Maybe that's one that we need to add. <coughs> okay, I will. Yeah, on the 802.020, yeah. definitions. That'd be a place where you can define that with any special events. As opposed to citywide community things, which people are going to come and want to rent rooms. Well, so I'm I'm reading it saying no short-term rentals. So that that facility or that house cannot be used for a special event, a wedding, a reception, a party is what we're looking to avoid. And, and the big part is is that that is a residence, and that is what it's intended for as residential use. And adding more of a commercial component to it is going to impact that neighborhood and then cause potential nuisance issues. Um, family reunions, things like that, where you're coming together as a family and you're not having a huge party might be, and you're just looking for more of a definition on what a special event is at that location. I just think it needs to be clear. So it's down the road when we're all going here, but this makes sense to future counselors and planners that walk in the door when they see it. Maybe it's okay, I'm just verbalizing it. Mm -hmm. That's what popped up in my mind, so I was looking to talk. Well, uh, my family's birthday parties were uproarious. That's events. not what I've heard. That's not what I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you have a list of sheltered lives. <laughs> so uh, what, what, what is the result of this discussion? Is the ordinance going to be changed? Or should the minutes just reflect the concern? Yeah, we're just one, discussing it. One point. possibility you could consider would be to be some, add some language in that section to say uh, after a show be used for special events to be conducted on the site of the short term rental. I think that would clarify that. It does not clarify what are special events. But I don't know, Josh, if any of the ordinances you looked at actually define that in terms of the number of people attending or the type of event. I don't think I would have. I would have to look back and check to see. Yeah, and it may need something to it. I think we just need to talk about it a little bit. Um, I have another question. We can get it done with that for a minute. Um, on page two of three, second paragraph. Once an application is approved, it is the responsibility of the operator to report all stays as the finance department or to the finance department who will oversee the collection of the TRT, the transient room taxes. And I was just curious about, do we follow up on that each month? Uh, is it up to the bed and breakfast owner to report to us each month or once a year? Or do we, do we send out a letter saying, hey, how many times has this happened? Or how do we keep track of that? It, once they're licensed, part of that licensing requirement is that they file monthly reports and okay. submit the funds at the same time. Okay. So we don't get those reports, then we have to follow up at that yes. point, hopefully, some department. Yes. Okay. Just curious. Thank you. Council on Curtis. So I actually do have a number of questions, but I was wondering um, if some of those might be answered if we had some public testimony from um, some of the people that I see in the audience if this impacts, because I'm curious about how they feel about things, not so much just about how I feel about things. Is that possible? Yeah, from the procedural, uh, we could open up the testimony sure. and that this council would yes. that. <coughs> so I'll just read that. I'm in favor of that. Any other questions for the staff before we get to public testimony? I have um, one. There's um, <coughs> implications in here or suggestions that the existence of short term rentals has an effect on housing value, and especially in Hood River. And I know we're not Hood River, but in Hood River, somebody submitted uh, testimony before the Hood River County Planning Commission, which 
is littered with suggestions that uh, short-term rentals have an adverse effect on housing values. Can you comment on that and um, how you see this happening in the valley as far as that goes? Yeah, um, so yeah, the, of course, the housing housing cost housing crisis um, is not, you know, a, definitely a complex issue. Um, I have worked closely with uh, both the planning director and the finance director of Wood River, and I was turned on to uh, um, actually Zillow.com has a pretty good um, section on one of their pages. It's about statistics, and you can compare two cities on top of each other. One thing they pointed out to me was April 2017 is when the city of the river adopted their, their short-term rental license. So I put the city of Hood River, whether this is entirely correlated as well, but putting the city of Hood River next to the city of the Dallas in that period of time, April, April 2017 to September 2019, the Zillow rent index for the city of Hood River went up 5.4%. City of the Dallas, 14.1%. Um, the median sales price in that period of time decreased 6.3% for the city of Hood River. It went up in the Dallas almost 50%. Uh, the median list price per square foot um, in that period of time it was a change of 3.3%. And in the depth in Hood River, in the Dallas, it was 39.2. So the argument there is <laughs> capping or adding restrictions to the short-term rentals. They argue has has actually shown a less a less of a spike than we've experienced here in the Dallas. Granted, there's so many other factors that play into um, into these numbers, you know, you could essentially say people are being priced out of the river coming to the Dallas, maybe that's where we're experiencing these, this um, increase that we have. But um, that is one um, statistic I, I was able to pull up for you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for the council at this point? Okay, at this point in the, in the public hearing, we'll ask for public testimony. Is there anyone here that would like to address the uh, city council? Please state your name and address. And again, uh, you, have a, you have up to five minutes for your testimony. Please keep it pertinent to the two ordinances. Thank you. Dan and Crystal Ross, 1609 B Street, there in the Dallas. So we've had an Airbnb, it, on Airbnb is listed as Caboose Cottage since 2016. We came to the city at that time and filled out an application, did all the things that we were supposed to. One of the steps to that was the city sent letters to our neighbors, neighbors being any property within 100 feet of ours. So if we're on G Street, it went clear to Kelly Avenue and clear down to 14th. At that time, there were no objections. Our, our application was granted. I am addressing 808.02.090 public notice. The ordinance states that they want to do um, this was done at the initial application. I be, we believe that it should only be done at the initial application, not annually. It's an expense to the city, and if it was a complaint, so if one of those people within that whole area already at the beginning, if there was a complaint, the city has the ability to pull that license. Also, we would have to reapply, and at that time, it would be recanted. So. I believe that only has to be done once at the initial application, or if something was to go wrong. It would be a waste of money to do it anyway. Questions? I agree. I agree. I agree. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Hello. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Ryan. I live at 508 West 12th Street here in the Dallas. Um, 
my wife and I, Julie, and I have been running the R&R &R Guest House here in the Dells. Some of you may have heard of it or known of it. Um, we, we originally put in to be permitted as a bed and breakfast. We, at that time, we were the first Airbnb in the city, um, but we didn't want to do it just like Airbnb does it, which is kind of a clandestine uh, type of situation where you can, you can register with Airbnb, but you have no relationship to the city or the transient taxes or such. My wife and I wanted to uh, participate in a way that we collected transient taxes and paid them to the city for the purpose of supporting our Chamber of Commerce. And so we went through the process of permitting at that time. It was probably uh, 2015, I think it was, or 14. Since then, we've hosted uh, people from all over the world uh, for, this was our sixth season. And um, just a little uh, perspective here. As we all know, in different situations like this, there's competing interests. Uh, naturally, it, it's not that people are being antagonistic. It's just there's there's different interests that you have as a city council, we have as a owner operator, etc. Um, the just as a perspective, my wife and I raised four kids. We were hand to mouth most of that time uh, until we moved up to Oregon and got out of Southern California, and um, we were we did never have. Uh, discretionary income to put away for retirement. So using this bed and breakfast uh, uh, business, it's considered a cottage industry. It's not a full commercial enterprise, okay? There's differences. Uh, there's a difference between a bed and breakfast, there's a difference between an inn, there's a difference between an inn and a uh, motel, there's a difference between a motel and a hotel. Um, so we are at the bottom of that chain where the, the cottage industry, uh, kind of one-to-one, -one, peer to peer But just as a perspective I was sharing, uh, this is, uh, we're using our, my wife and I are using our one main asset, our home, to now recover and start to plan for our retirement and start to, you know, create some extra income for ourselves. So it's, uh, it's been quite a blessing that way. Um, I have a couple things in the, the, the ordinance or the, the changes that you are considering. Um, I do think it needs to be scrutinized a little bit more. There's a lot of vague language in here on a number of points. And um, so you, you can kind of get yourself into trouble with vague language. Um, but a couple of things, uh, real quick. On uh, just while you were talking about it, about the um, the one uh, stipulation H, where it says no short-term rentals shall be used for special events. Uh, I would agree. Um, my wife and I we police our our guests, so we do we do two different models. We do a bed and breakfast, where we are there and we um, make breakfast for our guests and we interact with them quite a bit. They only have a room in the house and they're they're interacting with us. We also do a house rental, okay, which is very different. Um, in the first two years, uh, we had difficulty with, um, okay, with a few parties, uh, uh, with a few guests doing some things that we had explicitly, uh, and I say I'm painfully clear with people uh, to the point of making them uncomfortable about the rules of the home. So summing all this up, uh, we have to police our guests. So you're kind of, um, uh, an ordinance or a stipulation coming down on the owner operator is, you know, is one thing, but where, where this is really gonna make a difference in our community is when you have owner operators that do a good job of policing our guests. So when, when we have guests, um, we police where they park. We say it's our good neighbor policy. There's no parking in front of our neighbor's houses. Okay, um, we've not had any complaints. Uh, we went through the same permitting process where our neighbors were solicited, no, no comments. Because they know we've done a good job. So that's just one thing. Um, real quick, uh, the other main concern I have tonight about this is the parking, uh, the parking requirement. So uh, Josh, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding this, but 
it says after one guesses item D under short term rental uh, 8.02.050 item D, uh, there is one parking space for each guest room. Now this is, cons we're talking about off street parking or on street parking, that's a di the distinction you wanna make here. So after one guest room in the facility, so I'm, I'm trying to get clarification here in the past, it's been, we have, um, after two, we have four bedrooms in our, our unit that we rent. Um, after two uh, guest rooms are full, then the third and fourth require off-street parking. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because this says after one. <coughs> and that was one of the big changes was in the parking. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just want to make this point because that's an encumbrance upon homeowners. By definition, these, these facilities are, can only be built at, in, in the, a residential home. These are not commercial properties, okay? Um, so um, that's an encumbrance on, on a homeowner like ourselves if we have to somehow create off-street parking. Uh, we've made an arrangement with our neighbor who is an off-street parking uh, that she has uh, formally agreed to letting us use. Uh, so that's one, just one more thing here. Uh, the inspections, I think, uh, I'm good with all of this um, because I have no concern. When Julie and I went in the business, we didn't have to, but we asked the fire chief, chief to come out uh, uh, of our own will and inspect our home, and he did a thorough walkthrough of our home. We wanted to make sure we were proper and we were safe for people, and he gave us a, a he passed us. Uh, he said, no, you, you guys have covered everything. Um, but the inspections are gonna be important as far as who's doing those and some of the details as to what the requirements are there. Um, one last comment. I think we're out of time. Okay, with the fees, um, one thing is the annual fee, but then when you start to add other fees, uh, like home inspections or other certifications for kitchen or whatever it might be, you, wanna, you might wanna think about that because that can stack up. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Let me ask a question. Uh, <coughs> Sir, uh, Mr. McLaughlin has a question. I have, have a quick question. Do you have any opportunity or your wife to have input in this policy development? Uh, we, yeah, we have this, the, the uh, opportunity that Josh and his office had, had granted uh, as far as notification. Right. Uh, we were unable to um, submit a formal comment uh, before tonight. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Anyone else would like to address the city council or this public here? Uh, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Hello, uh, Victor Johnson, 514. Uh, good to see you all. Could you speak up into the microphone? Yeah, okay. Absolutely. I'm happy to do that. Victor Johnson, 514 Liberty Street. Good to see everyone. Um, I actually didn't receive the notice on this. I got uh, in September that Josh mentioned. I just read it just now for the first time, so I should have been more proactive and, and checked it out. Uh, let me say, first of all, I have full confidence in Josh and Don and, and Director Harris. I think they do a great job, as all of you. Um, and I'm probably in a rare position. I've actually had the issue on properties in other counties and things like that, Duke County and Crossville County and stuff. So I'm really familiar with all this stuff. Um, I'll just say briefly, um, the, all the people that are here tonight, uh, Eddie's, uh, Ryan's, and Ross, myself, we're all considered like super hosts in the Airbnb platform, which means we're the best, we're the highest rated, and, and all of us are actually really amazing ambassadors to the Dallas. We're sending people to the businesses, telling them where to eat, where to shop, bringing people in, making sure they have a good time so they come back and stuff. So I would just say to you, which you all know, I would really consider what they have to say because they are like some frontline people for our community and they really do a great job and it's and they're verified. They're award winning folks so to speak. So anyway, um, that's what I have to say. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Johnson? Anyone else? Anyone 
Anyone else like to address the council? Last call. Okay. We'll open up the uh, discussion to the city council. Uh, uh, council of Oakhurst. Oh, okay, um, one quick response, or maybe a few. Um, there will be no annual noticing. There's only a noticing of uh, neighborhood properties um, at the time of the initial application. Um, all current, all, all current BBB permit holders will, however, have to go through this brand new process. So there is no grandfathering in clause of old permit holders. Everyone will start, if this is adopted, current BBB holders, if we go through this process, we are taking that out of the code. So no longer will the BBB permit be valid. So therefore, the process for every current vacation rental needs to go through this process once again. But five years down the road, you gotta do it again. Correct. And does that mean you have to solicit your neighbors again? No, I... Just the initial. Just the initial. The only thing that happens every five years is home inspection. And we felt that this is the last, um, you know, this is opening your home, opening your home up to guests. Um, it, it, they could be in all different types of shapes. And, um, you know, this is kind of the last opportunity to, to make sure that our, you know, people coming in and using these properties are, they're, they're at least safe. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Lunk Curtis, I think I might have to do it. Um, so one of the questions that I had was one that um, Patty Crocker emailed me, and it was she said if I'm on vacation or out of the country, would I have an alternate or could I have an alternate representative? And um, I was happy to see that you basically said yes, and then the answer you gave though was pretty specific. It said um, that she would have to notify the. Uh, community development department within seven days before she left for vacation and so I was wondering like where is that specified in the ordinance it seems like if something is that specific as far as how it's going to be handled it needs to also be in the ordinance so people don't violate and they understand I mean seven days before or just before they go so you always have someone you can contact within 24 hours uh, yeah I, you know, to be honest I thought that was uh, it is actually stated in uh, the license requirements E. Um, that is where it talks about uh, the last sentence, property owners shall notify the department within seven days following any change in operator. Um, I take that to mean they replace someone, like a permanent change okay. in operator, not, okay. Um, so what, okay, yeah, we can uh, add some clarification to that. What that's designed as is uh, the, this requirement is uh, a little more lax than some that I've seen. There are some that uh, contact person must be available within one hour. And without that, there is um, an, an immediate, not in the revocation process, but there's essentially a strike against that. You know, So this creates the idea of hopefully party houses know a way to, to control party houses if, if there's a concern going on the cops or the, the police department is able to um, call someone and, and be able to, to shut down the property. No I thought that was very uh, reasonable I just I had missed or I had interpreted it differently so okay. I thought there were two separate things um, and then the other question I had is uh, what consideration was there or was there not about making these be owner occupied versus um, just the rentals with no one on premise. So that, um, it, I think it was thought about um, later on in the process. Um, you know, we definitely, it was, as mentioned before, we, we followed the current uh, BBB permit uh, process, the ordinance there. Um, and that was something that it, it was not added in. Um, we also wanted to take into account the current bed and breakfast holders and, and create something that um, they could still, that isn't going to, that these, we don't want these changes to uh, make everybody's unity legal. Um, and just looking at our current bed and breakfast inventory, uh, 
We have 22. Um, 13 of those are owner occupied. So if there were a language added in to um, require owner occupancy, we would uh, have a decrease in, at this time, 41%. go too far into the owner occupied language to be honest. And probably don't know this off the top of your head, but are those what we currently would consider a B and B, which has different definitions as um, Mr. Ryan was explaining, or are those um, houses that people have purchased and they're just renting out, but rather than like a long term rental, they're just doing under thirty days? Um those I guess some clarification is registered B and B of these twenty two. I'd say maybe two of them are registered B and Bs. Um, so I guess if you repeat the question, I'm kind of so maybe the question is um, right now if you register as a B and B, does that have a specific definition? Like it implies that the owner is on site and they're cooking breakfast and they're staying in their home or just because of the previous um, language in the code, is, is that unknown to us at this point? At this time it is. It's, it's one of these things that um, I had to, after through multiple reviews, it's one of those things that I have to almost pry, are you offering food? Um, that is an extra step that you go through uh, with the health department. Um, so the, the actual numbers of all of the um, current bed and breakfast holders that gone through that process. I, I am unaware. Um, as far as the new language, there's nothing really that spells out. Um, one thing that I think we, we moved away from are the different vacation rental, home share, all these different names. There are, these are all short-term rentals. And if you're a short-term rental with a food license, then, that's, then that'll be noted on the application. So are you looking at you're leaning more towards questions along the lines of bed and breakfasts possibly have staff working? I guess what I'm trying to figure out is um, if it's reasonable to say that I would prefer these to be owner-occupied units and what is the repercussion of that. So I'm not saying yes, I definitely want to do that because at this point I don't know what is my unintended consequence to existing businesses. So I guess if I was, since we don't know, if I was going to put that out there, that would be something that I'd like to propose and then have another public hearing for feedback because we really don't know at this point. Yeah, yeah, so the, the immediate, like I said, the immediate, we'd, we'd see the decrease of about 41%. I do know that there are some communities that have, um, like in Port, Portland, for instance, granted uh, the size is, is much different, but they have a 270 day rule. So that means that an, that an owner has to be living at their house 270 days out of the year. Uh, most of the critics of that uh, turn to the fact that um, who is monitoring people staying at their house 270 days out of the year. Um, the other is, I, and I, well, there's a, you know, the city of Hood River does have a 90 day, um, 90 days, days in a year. Um, Minus an audit through your finance department, it's um, very difficult to tell who is just staying within their 90 days. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's something that, uh, one thing I've noticed looking at all the different um, municipalities that I have, I think that is you know, limits can be, can be difficult to, to enforce. But. Well, I believe, is it, um Camden Beach has a, a rule about that. So they're trying to limit it from people just basically, um, you know, for the same thing, the housing crisis. Correct. And so I, I'm just trying to figure out what are our options so we can consider with actually knowing what's going to happen instead of just guessing or assuming. Yeah, like I said, I, I, I guess I can't speak, speak to what the impacts would be. Okay. Council Rendon, um, I want to go back to what Mrs. Ross was talking about, uh, you know, they, and the others that they pulled their neighbors, etc. They've done that. I realize we're going from a land use to a licensing situation. But I've also been around long enough in other venues that uh, there are sometimes waivers for things. 
And I just wonder if there have been no complaints in these particular neighborhoods that we currently have license and whatnot. To make me go through that piece of the problem across this again seems a little bit unwieldy. Uh, and that might be something to be considered. If there's a, they have to go through the other things because there's a licensing situation, fill out the applications and whatnot. Is it really necessary to go through the neighbors again who have never complained? If they've had complaints, we would know about that through either police or through uh, codes enforcement or something else. Um, and that would be something I would like to consider. Um, yeah, I think the, the noticing, um, uh, that is a good point. I, one thing about this, I think to, to, we should all keep in mind that this is essentially a brand new license. So these are setting aside the, uh, the groundwork for every new short term rental to come to town. So, um, I'm just saying we have yeah. existing folks, and that might be one area that. Uh, Okay. They've had no problems, so I would consider that as an addition, a waiver to existing okay. entities that are here, whatever the name is. I, I agree with that. Councilor Brown. I, I kind of agree with Josh. I think that the enforcement of the owner being on premises would be a whole new can of worms. It would be extremely difficult to require somebody's staff time. Uh, I mean, it's almost, you'd almost have to be hiding around the corner to, to know if they were there. I, 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 I understand the concern. I just think it would be an enforcement difficulty at best. I don't think so. It's by complaint. That's like many of our ordinances. And so I think the neighbors, I mean, they know who's there, who's not. They know if it's owner occupied or not, and if you have the contact information, and if you reach out to that person a couple times and they are in town or they're not around, they can't show you their bedroom in the house, then they're not there. But I think we just said it complaint driven. If you get a complaint, you get a complaint, you can act upon it. But otherwise, if there's no complaint, well, I don't we really need to like have somebody the complaint. Who needs to go up and police them. But, uh, any other uh, questions of the staff or comments? We'll call yes, close yes. Public hearing. Um, I appreciate having the opportunity for people to have input. That's very important, and I think you, you understand that as well. And through this process, it's fair, equitable, affordable, and reasonable, and I think you're meeting all of those things, so thank you. Yeah. Anything else before I close the public hearing? Public hearing is now closed. Any more deliberation for the, from the council before we uh, tell the staff or give the staff some direction? This is just a public hearing, but we have to come back at another meeting. Yes. Well, <laughs> you can answer tonight, of course. You could, but yeah, I have no like it the way it is. I have no interest in passing tonight. However, coming back with one more time, I think I'm in favor of. Have you have you have have you have a 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 have were you thinking more on the line of somebody who has an existing license does not have to pay the fee for the first because they've already got a license? Were you looking for the fee or were you looking for going through the process? I believe the council meant the process. The process. So if okay. someone already has a license, that should remain in effect, if I'm understanding correctly, as we transition over to this. Mm -hmm. And then they subject to the five year home okay. inspection. Potentially using, standing, potentially using their initial date of approval and then five years from that date. Mm -hmm. so if they're expiring in here, then they would start in here. So the current license would remain. But the current the license, license, you don't have to have an inspection. Correct. That is correct. I think there should be an inspection. This is the inspection every five years. Right. So, but the initial step was saying 
you're someone who already has a license for a short term rental, whether it's a bed and breakfast or Airbnb. And if they've had it for four years, they get to keep their license, but we're going to call it short term rental. But then five years is going to be one year from now. Oh, I'm talking about initially special. January 1. Going from a BBB to short term rental. I think the other question was parking requirements and needed to be to be clarified a little bit more and what's off street, what's on site. I know Mr. Johnson will have issues with uh, providing off site parking. Yeah, that's that is, like I mentioned, that's one thing that did change. Um, that currently our code reads and it's the only use in the entire municipal code that allows a short-term rental or a vacation rental to use the street frontage in front of the property for their parking. So that's when we took that language out of this proposed ordinance in the sense that every, and that is probably some clarification that does need to add to this, this code because it was intended to read that guests Guest parking needs to be provided on site, off of the street. After one, is that after one rental, one room rental? Two. After two. After two. Yes. Because of the holiday schedule, our, our next, our December 9th agenda will actually be going out Wednesday. So to bring this back and come in January. And we were looking at the, we have to change the effective date as well. But mm -hmm. We'll make all the Okay, is there any other um, suggestions or comments from the city council that would uh, help direct the staff? I just have one. Under the current rules, the way they are in the land use, whatnot, is there a five year thing where this all starts over again and have to have all those inspections and whatnot? Yeah, there is. That's why I went with the five year for the home inspection. Um, the home inspection obviously had an annually really didn't seem a little too much. And then five years, I think it's about, you know, between eight and 10 years, you should be replacing your carbon monoxide, your fire detectors, things like that. So five years look, uh, you know, kind of proactive in that, in that sense. And so, uh, again, I'm still asking for the waiver on the, the letters to the neighbors and all of that, but on the inspections and whatnot, uh, if somebody's been in business for three years, are you saying that two years from now, under the new rule, they would get one, or are you going to start a five-year period when we start this ordinance? Well, I don't know, because this all came as a curveball. So um, I was intending this whole time is we start from the very beginning. Everybody goes through the entire process. We get everything on the same page. Um, that is, you know, there is a grandfathering clause, if you will, that happened in the city of Hood River, and they're doing it. They're spacing it out over seven years. What they're finding there is over seven in the seven years, if you're not able to meet what the current code says, you're no longer a bed and breakfast. Well, this, you know, instead of including grandfather clause, adding something like that into the code, this says everybody starts out fresh. We make sure that all these things are met from the very beginning, and we do everything based on every single year starting January 1st. That is when your license is valid for the year to December 31st. So I, I had no intent, and I don't think our department intended on any type of grandfathering clause, if you will, but if that is something that wants uh, that we need to, to take no, a look I at. Think in my view, that, that's good except for the, uh, the you know, mainly the property owners and all that again, unless we have had complaints. If we've had complaints in the neighborhood, then everybody goes to square one or, or any individual that's had complaints. If there are no complaints, I don't see the value of it. Yeah, and the noticing, what the noticing is, is uh, most, most communities that I've found, it's either you place a placard in your front window saying that it's a short-term rental, um, you know, contact information, things like that. The other option, instead of a placard, is to do a neighborhood notice. So the neighborhood notice here is not intended on public, on, on comment from the neighbors. This is essentially telling your neighbors, we are going to operate a short-term rental in this location. Um, it, it doesn't have the comment, the 14-day comment period that comes with it. This is mostly just um, 
you know, letting the neighbors know that it's going to be there and instead of having um, what be kind of an obnoxious placard in the front of your house. And that's neighbors within 100 feet. Yeah, within 100 feet, sticking with the administrative action. Yeah. And that could be increased. Yeah. That's the currently we have 100 feet, but that, uh, like you said, it, it, it doesn't cover too many neighbors. I mean, we have 50 by 100 lots, it's pretty standard. So, anybody want to increase the 100 feet? No, I do. Yeah. I think most people would complain even if they didn't know it was a bed and breakfast if it was a problem. And if there's a problem, I think you right. complain regardless of whether it got a notice or not. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So then, based on that information, where they're not taking comment, they're just providing a notification, are you comfortable going ahead and yeah. doing that? Yeah. No problem. So that would be okay the way it's written. Then. Okay. I don't think it was clear. I didn't understand that myself that it was just an outward notification. Oh, okay. Well, I could probably find some uh, clarification on that. So am I. <laughs> okay, do you feel you have sufficient input from the City Council to bring this back uh, with the suggested changes? I, I trust it will be on January 13th. So I have a Council Yeah, so you asked me earlier about how we would prove residents, and what it turns out what Hood River did is they listed. Um, way you could provide a copy of your voter registration, a copy of your Oregon driver's license or identification card, or a copy of your federal tax return from last year, page one only. Financial information redacted. So that's three ways you could have someone prove that they are a resident there. Yeah, so I, there's a difference between a permanent resident and a primary resident. Isn't that a permanent resident is somebody who's there all the time, whereas a primary resident could be a part-time owner who is there two thirds of the time. Um, I guess that's what yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah. That's what I thought that sure. because your primary residence is not necessarily a permanent residence. Well, if you provided those three documents, that would mean that you consider that to be your primary residence. Right. Yeah, and if that's, you know, it's like, I, I really appreciate all the comments that have come in. I mean, I, um, you know, I want to have something that I work, work with you all on, so I appreciate that. Um, and if that is something that, that you feel, the owner occupancy, um, if we need to tighten up the language or add language um, that references those, those uh, three, I, I do know about those three requirements. They have two of the three or something, so. Um, I think what I'm proposing since we're coming back again is that I would like public feedback. I would like people who currently are in this situation to tell us what would that mean for them. Because it's hard for me to make a decision that's going to impact people without actually knowing what the impact is. Since the public hearing is closed, would you like staff to maybe send up an inquiry letter to the current owner? Because I think some of the people who testified earlier are not living in the home that they're renting as a short term rental. Is that I think I think those um, I think that's the majority. maybe minus minus Victor. I think his house. I don't know if he's living at the one on uh, Liberty. Oh, Liberty, yeah. <laughs> um, and I did want to be honest. I wanted uh, more more involvement um, from current bed and breakfast holders. Um, September 9th, we sent out a notice. Um, you know, at the end of the month, if we could receive any comment, I received four. And only one was written comment, and I sat down with the Rosses uh, to have additional conversation about it, some clarifications. But otherwise, most of the bed and breakfast permit holders were absent in this process, unfortunately. So um, I am more than happy to reach out once again and see if we can get some more hits. But <coughs> can we reopen uh, just written public comment for a specific amount of time to let people? It wouldn't, Comment. Be, it wouldn't be considered testimony because the hearing is closed unless you want to start the process over and do a whole other thing. Well, I guess that's a, I guess that's my follow-up. As far as the process, I mean, we were having public testimony, then we were debating, and then 
the issue for me came up, what is this, what's the answer to this? So, you know, how can, how can we get that information from the public? That's what I'm asking. And it doesn't have to be a long period, but maybe until December 15th, people could write in so the city councilors could know what people are saying. Mm -hmm. and if, if you like, we can include that into our staff report, the next staff report, all the comments on the Yeah, I would like that. And then hopefully the news media will pick it up and put it in a way that people will feel compelled to respond. As opposed to going through this whole process again. Correct. Because we have to make a decision. I'm just saying I want the information. Sometimes people reach out to me directly on issues, but I'm trying to make it more formal. Okay. Is that okay with you? Okay. Yeah. Once again, do you feel you have sufficient input from the city council to bring this back on January 13th? I believe I do. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. Work. Point of clarification <laughs> as an action item. Thank you. Next on the agenda is um, item 12A. We're going to be discussing the awarding of a contract for the East Scenic Drive Stabilization Phase oh. 2. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, this is part two for that. Oh, I thought that was all included. It was. I think they were all come back at the same time because this was subject to. Uh, it makes more sense to just uh, shelf this one until the other meeting because this. This next one would be actually removing it so we would sit in a period of, you know, have a last period of time where there's no permit. I think we need a concern. Okay, the uh, East Scenic Drive Stabilization Phase 2, Mr. McCain. Stabilization is to install the next 240 feet of uh, slope pile retaining wall. The retaining wall will be located um, on the north side of Scenic Drive, and it's in that segment between um, Jefferson Street and Esther Way. Uh, just for a brief, a brief uh, background and reassurance that this work is not related to or necessary for the historic um, Kelly Avenue landslide area that was um, done back in the 1980s. Uh, the Kelly, Kelly Avenue landslide was remediated with the installation of the dewatering wells and um, monitoring equinometers um, in the late 1980s. Since that time, we've had um, quarterly um, monitoring of the dewatering wells and, the, and those equinometers, um, and it's been continued to be determined that the Kelly Avenue landslide is stable and that it's not related to this stabilization project that we're doing. Uh, the, stabiliz the stabilization that we are doing is um, a segment of about 10 foot in depth that was determined um, from the uh, equilometer mon monitoring that was done um, back in uh, 2009, 2010 is when we started to see uh, some little bit of differences in those uh, um, in the equinometer readings. Um, so shallower displacements or movements have been determined to be located within the embankment fill material of the scenic drive uh, landslide, or, or the scenic drive, and have been determined to not again be related to the Kelly Avenue landslide. Um, when we did the recon reconnaissance um, studies for that, it was determined that the soldier pile retaining wall system was the best alternative for stabilizing that shallow, um, those shallow movements and that embankment fill material. Um, we're just now finishing up the East Scenic Drive Sanitary Sewer Project that we um, have contracted with Crestline Construction. Um, that was to remove the sanitary sewer that went down over the hill. Um, that's going to be located where this, that was located where this wall is being constructed. Um, we just issued the uh, uh, project um, significant completion on Friday, so we just have a few uh, uh, punch list items to take care of up there, but that project's pretty much complete. Um, so that now is done and leaving this uh, 
where we can start the, the stabilization project. Uh, we did um, we did advertise for bids um, for this stabilization project. We received four bids, of which Crestline Construction was the um, low uh, bid amount in the amount of $413,357. Uh, the city did uh, review the bids and uh, determined that the bids were all deemed complete. Um, we had an engineer's estimate for this project of uh, four hundred sixty-six thousand nine hundred twenty-five dollars, and so the uh, the low bids um, came in below that engineer's estimate. Uh, we did have five hundred thousand dollars budgeted for this project in um, Street Fund Thirteen, Line Code Seventy-Five Ten. Um, so, with that, um, staff recommendation is to move. To authorize the city manager to enter into contract with Crestline Construction for the East City Drive Stabilization Phase 2 project, um, contract number 2019-010, and an amount not to exceed $413,357. Any questions for Mr. McVeigh? Is there any part of state money coming into this? Wasn't there on the first phase? Yes, the, the monies that are allocated through this are from the Oregon Surface Transportation Program, the, the SIP program. Okay. Other questions for uh, Council Randall? So looking at the staff recommendation, and it, we see this all the time, there's an exact dollar amount there not to exceed 413357 what about cost overruns? Things happen in projects. How does that happen? Well, yeah. I mean, if there's if there's like a change order that comes, yeah. you're you're allowed um, it's like up to twenty percent in the change orders amount that are allowed to be um, granted for the project without having to come back to the city okay. council for, I just want that for change order. So there's a mechanism yeah. in there for those kinds of things. Thank you. Any other questions for the staff? Do I hear a motion? Motion. Uh, I move to authorize the city manager to enter into contract with Crestline Construction for the East Scenic Drive Stabilization Phase Two Project Contract Number 2019-010 in an amount not to exceed four hundred thirteen thousand three hundred fifty-seven dollars. Second. Mr. Rubin, second. To authorize the contract. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next on the agenda is 12B, uh, post-project progressive design build contracting and for the contract for the wastewater treatment plan upgrade. Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Honorable Mayor, members of council. Uh, <clears throat> City Council previously adopted resolution number 14-014, which exempted the contract for the wastewater treatment plant upgrade project from normal competitive bidding and allowed us to use progressive design build contracting for that project. Uh, in that resolution, two findings were adopted. One uh, is that it uh, was the use of progressive design build contracting uh, was not, would not, excuse me, uh, Encourage favoritism or substantially diminish competition. And the second one was that it was expected to provide substantial cost savings to the city. Both state regulations and the city contract review board rules require that when a project is exempted from normal competitive bidding, uh, that a post project evaluation be conducted. And this report is intended to provide that evaluation. As council knows, under a normal traditional uh, project delivery method, which we call design bid build, there's usually two contracts that are issued, one for design and another one for construction. And the design does not necessarily benefit from any input from the construction contractor. Under the progressive design build, we hired a, it, we issued a city, city contract uh, to a design build team where the construction contractor is on board from day one and has the opportunity to provide information and input into the design to help improve with the efficiency of the construction of the contract. The related specifically to the findings uh, 
of the resolution number 14-014. The first finding uh, about it not being likely to encourage favoritism or diminish competition, the city took a number of measures to ensure that that was the case. First, before we came to the council to seek authorization to use this contracting method, uh, staff sent out letters of uh, request for letters of interest to a number of different entities. And we got a very favorable response back indicating that the project was a viable candidate for using progressive design work contracting. With that information, staff came to the city council and got the authorization to use uh, progressive design build contracting. Uh, and then we used a two-step procurement process. The first was a request for qualifications um, where statements of qualifications were received and evaluated. Uh, we then invited the top three, and in fact, we ended up being only three responders uh, to actually submit proposals to uh, our, request for, our request for proposals. The evaluation process then that we used uh, to uh, rank those proposals, we used five different staff members from two different part departments in the city to try, try to be sure that we were not uh, experiencing any favoritism uh, in the award. We utilized a numerical rating system that was identified in the uh, RFP so that all the contractors knew how they would be scored uh, prior to submitting their proposals. And uh, ultimately, a design build team that was led by Mortensen Construction, uh, who was a company that had never done work for the city before, was selected. So we think this pretty, uh, that's, that the, all of these facts demonstrate that the use of progressive design build contracting did not encourage any favoritism in the award of the contract. Related to the second finding, uh, that the method of contracting was likely to provide substantial cost savings. Um, because we exempted the project from normal competitive uh, bidding processes, we were actually able to request some pricing information for the engineering services that we otherwise would not have been able to ask for. Um, through the evaluation process, it was ultimately determined to uh, select the firm that actually had the lowest markup rate of any of the uh, three proposing teams. Uh, their markup rate for on the direct cost for uh, profit and overhead was 4% compared to 5% to 10% for the other two. So that by itself saved the city an estimated $140,000 to $850,000 on the project just by having that lower markup on the, on the work. I've already mentioned that the process involves the construction contractor from day one, and that allowed for a lot of conversation and decisions, value-based decisions to be made on the most efficient way to construct a contract. Uh, we had a couple of really good examples of that during the design, uh, when the construction contractor was suggesting modifications to what we call the grid chamber and building it in a different way that would be faster and easier for the contractor to build and therefore a lower cost. And another one was uh, related to the construction of, of our primary filter base. Again, thereby reducing the total cost of what the project could have been. Uh, there were a number of individual specifics. Uh, we had originally anticipated that a new building would be built for the influence pump station. We actually were able to make the influence pump station modifications within the existing building, so there were cost savings associated with that. Uh, we identified the opportunity to use primary filtration technology, which was pilot tested through this process, and again, was not part of our original scope of work, but was identified through this forum of project development uh, involving the engineer, the project owner, the construction contractor, and the uh, project operator, which for us is Jacobs Construction. Um, and we identified that we could avoid the construction of new aeration basins in the, over the next 10 years, and that the cost was about $1.2 million. Or savings, excuse me, of $1.2 million. The original plan identified the need uh, for construction of a slip storage tank. We were able to eliminate that at a cost savings of $1.4 million. Uh, we identified that it would be feasible to do cogeneration, the generation of electricity using methane gas to power the system which was projected to save uh, the operation about $30,000 a year in electrical costs. We 
also finally uh, used, um, based all of our decisions on which alternatives to implement based upon 20 year life cycle cost analysis. So it wasn't just a, an evaluation of the cost to purchase and install equipment, but also how much to operate and maintain that equipment over 20 years. Uh, Council that was in place at that time might remember that we had a number of workshops associated with the project. Uh, we identified seven different scenarios that were all different than what the, was previously identified in the master plan. Uh, and in each case, we selected the uh, scenario for implementation that provided the lowest 20-year life cycle cost uh, to purchase, install, operate, and maintain. And then lastly, as part of the development of the guaranteed maximum price for the project, all that pricing was done in an open book manner. Uh, we had access to all the unit costs and, and all the quantities that the contractor, or excuse me, the design builder was proposing for the project. And we found all those costs to be within industry standards. The project uh, total guaranteed maximum price for the entire project was $14,757,914 and we came in $3,000 under that. All of these factors taken together, we believe, demonstrate that the method of contracting for this project provided substantial cost savings to the city. And with that, it's staff's recommendation the council move to accept this post-project evaluation report related to the utilization of progressive design build contracting for contract number 2015-004 of the Wastewater Creek Pipe Upgrade Project. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Anderson? Mr. Councilor McLaughlin. I am the one remaining councilor that was at that. I was looking around. No, you're not. I, I think we've got a couple. This was prior to your coming on, though. No, it was Close not. To Anyway, we had passed uh, substantial rate increases based on projected costs yeah. that we were able to to bring back in line and reduce. Or, you know, we have we had any price increases since that time? No, we've held steady for five years. Now. So, uh, you know, what better things can we say about this project other than it saved money, it's on time, and the new technologies that the company brought in saved substantial monies, and this is a win project. I mean, everything that's happened, so I am thrilled with how this project has turned out. And it's been a long process, but it's been very effective for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Any other qu uh, questions or comments? Very thorough, thank you. How about a motion to accept the post-project evaluation oh, yeah. report? You go ahead. You're one of those two. Move to accept this post project evaluation report related to the utilization of progressive design build contracting for a contract number 2015 004, the wastewater treatment plant upgrade project. Yes. Oh, I'm going to second that. <laughs> It's been moved and seconded by the two oldest council members. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little respect uh, uh, here. Uh, uh, no, <laughs> Is there any uh, more discussion or questions? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you very much. Final item on the agenda is adoption of a resolution accepting a dedication of a portion of property on East 17th Street. Thank you. Um, as mentioned, this, uh, I think this one will be short and sweet for you. Um, <laughs> so uh, this, uh, Deborah, Deborah J. Tipton has uh, requested to dedicate a portion of her property on East 17th Street. It's about, you know, it's a little bit off of Morton Street. Um, <coughs> further described in this staff report to the city for future public right-of-way purposes. Uh, total square footage is uh, about 5,800 square feet, and uh, the city um, future intended use would be for the expansion of East 17th Street. Um, at this time, there is no development plans for this property. Uh, staff recommends uh, we move to approve the adoption of resolution 19-028 and accept the dedication of property on East 17th Street. <coughs> Any questions for Mr. Chandler? 
Can I hear a motion for adoption of a resolution? Yeah. Councilor Long Curtis. I'll move to approve the adoption of resolution 19-028, accepting a dedication of property on 17th Street for public street purposes. I'll second. It's moved and seconded to accept the, uh, the resolution 19-028. Is there any more discussion or questions? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That concludes our action items. Uh, is there any other business to come before the city council? If not, I declare this meeting at her.